Hi everyone, and welcome again to my audiovisual channel. Coming at you today with strong, scary spice vibes. I'm Gabrielle Handel, a draftsman and the host of this show, A Conversation About Art, during which I look for the meaning of art and beauty through conversations with colleagues in different artistic fields. Today, I bring you episode 26, and I will have this conversation with Jess Leo, a fellow draftsman. Um, uh, Jess and I graduated in 2015 from the New York Academy of Art, and she was also a draftsman uh, drawing major, and it's pretty exciting to be able to talk to her about this stuff, um, because, uh, well, she's just a cool lady, and well, that's generally why I have people on here, because I'm interested in what they have to say. So uh, I hope you enjoy this episode and thank you very much for watching. Please remember to subscribe to my audiovisual channel, uh, like the video and share the video with whomever you think might be interested in this subject matter. And uh, yes, thank you very much for doing those things. I encourage you to do them all. Those are all forms of support and they were very much very welcome uh, forms of support for the podcast. And well, this is the second intro that I'm trying also through just pre-recording it on Zoom, the same Zoom that I'm going to talk to Jess uh, on in a little bit. Uh, so, well, I think I'm going to stick with this for now. And maybe sometime soon, sooner rather than later, there will be some kind of sponsorship type thing here. So thanks again, and I hope you enjoy the episode. Okay, Jess Leo, my guest for the day today and my podcast. A Conversation About Art, episode 26. So Jess, thank you very much for your time and for talking to me today here. And please tell the people who will watch and listen who you are and what you do. Okay. Um, so my name is Jess Leo. Um, I am currently living and working out of my Brooklyn studio. Um, and I've been here for a couple years, but I've been in the city for it's like nine years now, which is pretty wild. <laughs> um, and my primary focus is drawing uh, in graphite specifically. And then I am sometimes a printmaker and maybe sometimes a sculptor. I'm very sometimes local. sculptor, you say? Yeah, uh -huh. I've been doing just experimenting with very small sculptures. And I have kind of a fascination, like a deep fascination with sculpture. Uh -huh. And I, I mean, you can see that too in, in the drawing and in how I just structure my images. So um, it kind of is like a round circle back to the initial inspiration, let's say. <laughs> okay, so then which, what is the initial inspiration? I think it's so funny. I was, I was looking at some writings from a while ago and realizing that I was always interested in sort of like a psychological space, um, maybe more specifically a psychological place at that time. Um, and then it sort of moved outward from there and it became a conversation about maybe not just a person in space, um, but how to use this space to invoke um, Kind of a response to either loss or grief or um the consciousness so I, I use a lot of these sort of like architectural structures and simplified objects to create a space for contemplation uh-huh okay so a lot of times what you'll see in my drawings is that there's kind of this singular object suspended in white space and i'm doing that to create a point you know it's not because i don't want there to be this sort of physical embodiment of space but i, I want to sort of suspend the object in kind of infinity almost or or in a way that it can kind of bleed out into the two-dimensional structure that is the wall and become like an artifact of that space. Um, much the way I think like installation artists work. Installation? You know? Yeah, installation oh, artists. Oh, installation. <laughs> yeah, I heard installation. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but it becomes a much more like immersive kind of space where you're 
confronted with the object in a much more like pointed fashion, right? It's like when you come across a, you know, a two dimensional piece of artwork, which is what like sort of you and I both work in, it kind of becomes an object in itself. So I'm really, I was interested at the time and I think I still am with about how do I create a two dimensional object that somehow or seemingly both two dimensional and three dimensional and in the reality or in the space with us, the viewer at the same time. Okay. But then how does that, how does that talk about the psychological things you were talking about just now? Sure. So I think I, I, I use a lot of limiting factors in my work. And one of them is obviously color, you know, I'm working on a monochromatic scale. So I feel like reducing the amount of color in a way is creating sort of a sensation for me, um, where the viewer sort of has to focus on the object itself. You know, there's mm -hmm. nothing, I mean, I think drawing is deeply illustrative, but I think at first glance, when you see a drawing, it's sort of like an incomplete representation of reality. The drawing. So, so I think for at least my hope is that the viewer sees that and then there's a moment of contemplation as to why it has no value, like no color versus color. Um, and then I, and then the focus becomes not about color and kind of the, the glitz and glamour of like a smooth illustrative surface, but then about the form itself. And I, I work very hard to figure out specific lighting for each of the forms that I'm setting up in this sort of like in, infinite space. Um, and because it's just, you know, maybe five uh, types of tone across a single object, like you, you have to deeply focus on on that movement or that progression or gradation that is happening. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't give you a lot to look at sometimes. So I think that becomes sort of psychological to a degree is that you're really looking at the object and this sort of soft light that is cascading it and giving it this form sense, this, this sense that you can touch and be in existence with it at the same time. Um, and for a while I was using wood grain um, to a sort of a narrative function. And I think, you know, universally we see wood grain in a lot of domestic spaces. So for me, that became part of this psychological story or place I wanted the viewer to be in with me. I wanted to, to hearken back to it, but also not be so specific that they got lost um, in, in in my memory, I wanted them to almost fall their own memory of, of a wood green or a texture or a sensation of light. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so because wood grain is commonly in people's homes, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like wooden floors or maybe walls or roo the roof, you know, depending on uh, how the place is made. Um, so then it does make a lot of sense that a person would have like a sense of familiar, uh, like really deep familiarity with the wood grain because like maybe their bedroom had mm -hmm. wooden floors or whatever, door, yeah. wooden door with wood grain and stuff. And so like, I mean, I'm trying to like, uh, word it, re uh, you know, reword what you were saying, uh, to see, to see if I get it. Um, so so then when you make the drawings with wood grain it's an object that is uh the object that you make uh, you only use graphite like you make it as monochrome as possible because uh, of course we know that there are shades of gray with graphite uh but then you reduce the value uh the value scale as much like you tighten it as much as possible then to remove all possible distractions from the surface the wood grain surface of the object itself and so like try to call on that familiarity the person might have with wood grain does that seem right um yes and no i think like the limitations of the value for me are more so that 
it becomes that there's a sort of silence in the work. You know, when you think about, like when I think about charcoal drawing, right? Like the immediate mark is usually black, mm -hmm. right? Of like a compressed charcoal. And so then you have immediately black up against like the white of your paper, typically in that yeah, scenario. Yeah. And that contrast, that's very graphic. Very high contrast too. Yeah, very high contrast. It has a punch. I think that leads you into a very specific idea of what the art is going to be or the image is going to be just naturally like I think a lot of people do love high contrast like when you're in a really sunny day and you see like a really awesome shadow and it's yeah yeah so intense you're like wow I gotta I gotta take a picture of that or I gotta look a little harder it's because it's sharp you know yeah yeah I just wanted to like remove a kind of sharpness from the work so that the reaction to it is much slower like the read and the progression of value is slow. That's at all possible. Uh, I, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, and then the, so wood, yeah, then the wood ahead, grain becomes another layer. <laughs> yes. No. 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 Okay. So then, all right. So then, the part about the light and the softness of tone, then is because because then that that kind of I feel like that connects with what you you were saying about contemplation, like when you said slow. Because I mean, the the light is very soft and everything, and. Um, and the work is quiet, like everything is very s effectively soft. Mm -hmm. um, and so the the viewer has to look at the look at the drawing for a little while. Mm -hmm. So like that's a contemplation part. Yeah, right because you yeah. have to you have to be with the thing for a bit, look at it and kind of you know ex explore the wood grain that you, lovingly made yeah yeah for sure okay. um yeah i think i think the wood grain was like a integral part for me at the beginning because i wasn't sure if, if just the value itself could hold or structure the drawing and again i was i was very interested at the time at this narrative discussion and um i was exploring my childhood home and that was just something that was very frequent to many of my memories and so it felt an important part of the, the conversation to add in like these specific examples of wood grain throughout the work um and again it is it felt also universal enough that the viewer could see it from their perspective as well you know it wasn't distinctively mine you know, I could, we could share the memory together. It was, was the hope that makes any sense. <laughs> I mean, that, that does make sense. But then, but then I, I feel, I feel like, I mean, uh, of course it, it, it does make sense. So, so then what I understand from that is that, uh, kind of like, I mean, it, I guess it reminds me of what I was musing about a second ago, that because wood grain wood is present very often in a household, mm -hmm. then it would summon the person's own memory of their home and then you know because obviously a viewer has no way unless you tell them in a lot of detail or like unless they go to your childhood home because mm -hmm. i mean so what you're trying to call up in their own mind is not your memory of your childhood home but then a memory of theirs that maybe has like the same degree of uh not intimacy but like that you know the feeling of childhood or just like Nostalgia, I guess. I, I'm annoyed that I can't think of another term because I have heard that term so much recently. It just, it's like when, you know, when you say a word a million times and it stop, stops meaning whatever it means. Right. So anyway, but yeah, I have no imagination. Uh, nostalgia in the viewer by uh, showing them this wood grain that they yeah. hopefully have in their own uh, something. I like that. what you said about like intimacy. It's a, in, like creating an intimate space, I think. Maybe that's my association with the wood grain. It feels very intimate. Um, and I feel like I can share that with an audience. And mm -hmm. like, they, yeah, they can just bring their own experiences to the work. That, that's, been, that's been a thread throughout. Um, maybe I'm sometimes a little bit too conscious of it, but it, it feels important. You know, too as an artist, it's so hard to connect to 
sometimes it's really hard to connect to people through words. I mean, I think that's why we're- Ah, uh, yeah, okay, yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay, no, that makes, that makes perfect sense. Uh, sometimes it is definitely difficult to find the right word. It's like, I don't want to use nostalgia, then what word do I use? I don't know. Um, okay, and like the intimacy part also makes a lot of sense because it's like, I mean, I've seen your work in person mm -hmm. and effectively the work is kind of suspended somewhere in just like the endlessness of the paper of the paper it's uh because you know it's not difficult i mean it's easy for me to imagine anyway a big piece of paper just any really any piece of paper like the space where morpheus shows neo like what you know with the tv and the whatever and like that it's like it, it's like an endless depth or whatever who knows what i right so like it's easy to imagine a piece of paper that way and so like if, if you place the object there then you know it's like the viewer and the object and it's just the just the two of them and then that's it and I, you know now that i'm talking about it that way i can see how somebody would even be like maybe intimidated by the degree of it's just like just me and this object now it's like i don't know it's like uh it can be i, I can imagine it also being scary in a way because it's like you're like with this mysterious obelisk thing Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, depending, I suppose, on what uh, relationship the person has with wood and wood grain, you know, I guess. Um, just any okay. object, you know, in general. Yeah, like, any object. You're sure. just like based in a quiet room yes. with a single object. I mean, what, what happens? You know, what happens to the psyche in that moment or the unconscious or... No, you could have tripped earlier in the day and scratched your knee or you're feeling your knee pain because it's so quiet and there's just this thing looking at you and you're sort of like feeling your body in a totally different sensation or you know are you remembering the time that you were at um i don't know uh, at a party with a friend you know it's just something that's like it's almost like a mirror in that way mm. i guess a lot of art is um but yeah if, if it's quiet enough i the hope is that you're able to have that sort of sensation or experience. I also don't feel like it necessarily has to be super quiet. Or, like I, I can imagine, because I think you've told me before, uh, like the, the visualization kind of that you have for showing your work. And it's obviously really cool because it's like the big drawings and a big space. And it's like quiet with like this warm light, mm -hmm. maybe wood floors, you know, who knows? Mm -hmm. And it's like echoing off of that. And because I mean, I, I you know, that's um, I feel like uh, arguably that's a, a common set setting for showing work and you know if you get really lucky there's very few people there and it's really effectively a quiet experience of but but, and, but I mean at the same time I don't I, I don't feel as though it's strictly necessary to have that specific empty room thing uh, or you know quiet space to necessarily be able to find that in in, in, in your drawings I think at least I don't know I mean I kind of because um, I have, uh, I don't remember what it's called, but I have these the prints that you, that, that, uh, remember the, these prints? I don't remember, is that on wood boxes. also? Yeah, it was in, yeah, it was a wood cut. Wood cut, yeah. And, and, you know, I don't need necessarily to have them to, I don't need necessarily to have them be bigger uh, or, or to be alone with them or whatever. It's just like, I sometimes will be looking through work that I have and I'll, I'll see them and I'll like order them, put them in order and I'll just like enjoy them, you know, for a bit. And it's like, because, well, I, I mean, I, sh I should explain myself for whomever views, watches or listens. I have some of Jess's work because it's cool work, okay? And I wanted it. And it's these um, woodcuts of effectively one of her boxes. And uh, what's it called? I don't remember what it's called. Find. Find? Confined. Confined, yes, okay, yeah, I, okay. And so it's this woodcut that's, and, and it's uh, five little woodcuts, woodcuts, and from beginning to end, they start like to fade. I'm describing it for whoever listens or watches, because you obviously know this work. It fades, like the ink slowly disappears, and then the very last one is just embossed. Mm -hmm. And maybe, maybe I'll put up a picture sometime or something. I don't know how to do that in video yet, but it's a really cool uh, piece of work, and the audience will just have to trust me for now. <laughs> yeah, that it's I don't really think I've ever, um, I don't think I've photo documentation of like that full set. It was sort of just 
an experiment. <laughs> uh huh. Well, yeah. I mean, I think I think I tried to photograph it once because I wanted to show off that I had it, and I was like, I have no idea how to. It's difficult with work, you know. Um, it just uh, any artwork, arguably, it's really difficult to show just a photograph of it. It really, I feel like the f photography tends to be a disservice to the original. I think that's um honestly for good work. I I think that is is a good sign, you know. Oh yeah, for it, sure. Yeah, it's like uh, in the in the age of, you know, media everywhere. Like mm -hmm. if the work is better online. Um, I think that the artist has to spend some more time in the studio. So, you know, <laughs> it's unfortunate because no one can really see it online and like sort of appreciate it. But like when it's in person, I, I hope that it has the intention is there. <laughs> oh, yeah, it definitely does. Uh, in my opinion, anyway. And I mean, I've seen your work in person again. I'm just showing off that I have seen your work in person because I think it's cool. And I, I like that I've seen it in person and have like uh, coexisted with it physically. OK, um, so OK. M All right. I, I wanted to ask you other stuff about printmaking. So why do you like printmaking? Mm, I like printmaking. Oh, no, there's so many answers to this, I think. I think the first one and it might be sort of a funny one. Um, not really. But when you're introduced to something new in college, you know, like this is like, go to college is the marker of like, you get to explore whatever you want, do whatever you want. Uh, and I enter this classroom and I had this incredible professor. She expected just, just so much work from you. So I already <laughs> was, a little, I was like, I love that. It pulled me right in. And then the process of it, I think creating the drawings and, and then making the, you know, plate or the matrix was really interesting because there is sort of this like relief-esque process. It, it's like almost like a small sculpture that you're making and, but it feels rather safe because it's still two dimensional. Mm. So just be able, being able to like explore the bounds of that. And I, at that point, I. I don't think I really understood if I wanted to just draw or if I wanted to be a painter. I think I was under the impression that like you had to be a painter to be an artist. Mm -hmm. So then somebody gave me this tool and they were like, no, you can just use black and white. And it was like such a lovely, safe, experimental space that I kind of held on to that feeling until, I mean, all the way through college and then back into grad school um, where I was able to play with it some more. and. I just, sometimes I don't know if I make the right connection between the drawings and the prints, but I just, I experiment so much more in the like secondary medium in that space mm -hmm. <laughs> that it's become kind of like my fun space, um, whether or not it ends up being like a final image or not. Um, I always love like relief printmaking. I don't know if I found like the exact voice I need to have in it. But um, yeah, I'm never gonna leave it behind and done this two years ago. And then to the present, I'm doing these dry point um, plates where I'm like integrating folds and like some of the geometry that I've been interested in, in the whole time, but it really came together in this series. So now I'm, I'm kind of doing that a little bit as well, oddly enough. So it's not just me taking the larger drawings and cutting them into wood. It's now they're starting to have a little bit of their own language and their own voice. The prints, the printmaking. Yeah, I think, yeah, the dry point and etchings especially, I think fit into where I'm going to go a little bit more than some of the relief work, but I'm excited about it, so. Okay, so then how would you say now, I mean, now that you feel the the print aspect of your work come up, uh, you know, like you were saying, finding its own voice, like coming to its own, how would you say that it differs from the drawings? How is it different then from the drawings? Yeah, I mean, like, obviously it's a different medium, but like, uh, you know, what are you saying with each one that's different? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think... Let me say, let me start off with what I think the drawings are, and then maybe that'll get me to my conclusions about what I think the prints are. I think the drawings are about form and light, and like they're my studies. 
almost and like mm. what I can sort of do with the medium and I I don't think I fully grasped you know how to make that straight line curve or you know how to push something deep into space so that's that's kind of the, the drawing screen and then when I move to the print side I think I'm trying to extract from the drawings, some sort of like iconography or just icon for that matter, that can be sort of simplified and, and packaged in sort of this small, smaller space. So funny, the drawings are like huge, or used to be huge. And the prints are like this physically intimate space for me because I am like, I can actually sit at my desk with it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they're almost uncomplicated in a way. Um, whereas I think the drawings become like so deeply complicated in, in trying to fulfill all of my artistic needs. The prints are like, oh, hey, I had a box in my drawing. Can I make a box smaller in this print? Does it even need, does it just need value? Does it need wood grain? Can it be flat? I think that's where I started experimenting with like truly flat space. Like I'm. Yeah, and then the idea that you're able to make multiples, that's where the experimentation comes in, where I'm like, oh, maybe not. And then I you know, throw another sheet of paper under it, or I emboss it, and I emboss it, and then I put graphite on top of it. So um, yeah, they feel like little icons of what the larger work is. Um, I think that is fun for me, because I am interested in like geometry and roundness versus flat a lot of mm. times so I, th I think the prints do they feel that kind of desire i like would love to be someone that could just move shapes around and like on a piece of paper and feel like that could just be my art but not always the case so sometimes like the print process allows allows me to loosen up a little bit mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah that makes that makes a lot of that makes a lot of sense i mean because especially the part about simplicity when you're working on the on, on what uh, a piece of wood or a lino or no the what you were saying the dry point and etching stuff because you don't have i wouldn't say that you build that up the way that you build up the drawing because it's like i mean i don't think i ever actually saw you working but you have described it and it's like you, you layer the layers of graphite you know and um in the larger drawing thing. yeah 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 with the yeah. with the with the drawings um and it's just like layers. I mean, I don't know how many layers. I don't know if you keep count of the layers of graphite that you're putting on there, but I okay. figure that it's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, you know, building the graphite on top of it. And then that's kind of what you make the depth with, or, mm -hmm. you know, just like the wood grain with rather, because uh, in a way, wood grain is for sure, arguably the endless like that, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose, I mean, you can't do that on, on etching necessarily, you know, because it's like, I, I guess I don't know how to, if if you can, because I, I haven't done etching, etching, so I don't know. You arguably have just, just so, so many layers. And I think you, you know, printmaking is something where even if you're very good at it, you don't have to think about it as much, but I think you still do. Um, but usually it's, it's, a, it's a planned exercise in, in how many layers you're going to need. I, don't, I wouldn't call myself a printmaker in that sense because it, it's hard to like look at an image and be like, okay, I'm going to break this down into you know five uh, layers that yeah. I can print. But yeah, yeah. so I keep I keep it relatively simple. I kind of just work with like the tonality of the paper and then the matrix of the plate, um, and then sometimes I try to do some other experimental things in there. Mm -hmm. You know, recently I've been making my own ink out of the graphite uh -huh. here so that that's really cool yeah so that has like that kind of softness and then i can sort of regulate like the deep gray versus like a lighter transparent gray and yeah. um because originally or the way i mean honestly the way the whole series started was from a single lino embossment and then i just um, did like almost a rubbing of that so yeah, rather than me doing the additive process after the print has been made of putting graphite on it, it has become that 
I'm mixing the ink, it's going to be graphite, and then it's going to be printed as such. So. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so I think uh, now that I just heard you talking about it, the, you, I mean, there is the possibility of layering in printmaking, like an etching, I suppose, but you have to make different plates yeah. for each, what would be each layer, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yes, it okay. feels very like unnatural to maybe a drafts person that's just like used to sort of setting up their space and their drawings in a specific way. And yeah, I have a hard time breaking down my process in the drawing to be a print sometimes, you know, yeah. maybe what a master printmaker is for. <laughs> so. Well, I mean, that, I mean, but that makes perfect sense because it's like, it, I mean, it makes perfect sense that you, that you wouldn't, that you don't necessarily know how to break down the layers from your drawings and transform them into layers for printmaking because the, the layers in drawing are not separated from each other. Mm -hmm. They're not isolated from each other in a way they would be in printmaking if you use different layers. Cause it's like all of the layers are like, weaved together and it's like how do you how do you even separate that i mean i, I, I don't know it's like uh it's it's uh like an abstract idea but at the same time it's like actually like that in a way very, of like the layers being interweaved in a drawing yeah it's, it's very concrete and to be honest like i don't think i'm that interested in in taking the process of my drawing and moving it to another medium like it my drawings function for what I need them to be in their mm. process. Yeah, and yeah. I don't feel like that needs to be supported by printmaking. I feel like the printmaking can be something other. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, that's that's kind of the point of, of, of trying, of, of, of just using another medium, that it's completely different from the other medium. Okay, okay, Jess Leo, what is art? Oh, what is art? Yeah, it's so funny. I've actually had students ask me this. It always feels like it puts me on the spot because if it's wrong, then you'll they'll leave the conversation and and sort of never come back to me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I guess what I can narrow it down from what I understand it to be, or maybe what it like functions for me and like my you know cohort or colleagues is that like I think it's always been a way to sort of understand kind of the, the, the world, you know, and at the beginning of quote unquote art, you know, it it served as sort of a model of our existence, whether that be handprint, whether that be creating icons and symbols so that people that couldn't read could visually take part in the act of understanding how they needed to present themselves to the world. Um, then does la then later, you know, space and light comes into it. So then it's not just an understanding of ourselves, but nature and the world and then how we exist in that world. Um, and I think now, like as a 21st century artist, it's, it has deeply become rooted in, in sort of the self, right? Um, maybe more than like an archive of, you know, yeah, I, I think art is like sort of like an archive of our struggles and understanding ourselves and the world around us. Like that, that's all it is. Like if there was no art historian to define what is art, then what would those objects be? It would be artifacts in you know, I mean, even like when you go to the Met and you go and you see like the way people fashion bowls and knives, like to me, that is all art. That's mm. not separate from a painting made in the 1960s, you know? I mean, that was a usable object, but in its own way, somebody made that with their hands with intention, their hand was in it, and then they used it, right? Um, and I guess that goes back, you had to read this in, in graduate school so maybe it's something that you know you can talk on too but um lewis hyde when he's talking about the gift oh, I always thought that lewis hyde uh-huh um and so he's he wrote the book the gift and i thought that was a really interesting presentation of like what art can be or what it sort of was is that it wasn't something for us to just have like as a singular person, like in my studio, I'm holding all my artifacts, all the things I've made, 
and I'm sort of storing them, but really the act of transmission of me giving you the piece of art so that you can enjoy it or use it. And then when you're done with it, you hand it over to somebody else, right? And that's sort of the extension then of language, of an understanding, of being able to read and to learn. So I think I like to think about art then in, in those contexts, like it is a way yes i think as an art maker to understand yourself but for the world maybe how things function to see the hand in it um and maybe that's why i just love fine art a little bit more than perhaps digital art like i you know it's illustrative and i like will move toward digital art but yeah the, the act of the hand in it to me makes it makes it art mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, I like that that idea about what art is. It reminds me of s something. I mean, a similar thing that we that I talked about with uh, Dan Thompson in a previous episode, because he was talking about how the object of art, whatever it is, drawing, pottery that is that has a allegedly more utilitarian use to it or, or just the drawing or whatever it is it's the result it's the result of any and all circumstances before it mm -hmm. so um it's like a clue left behind of a period in time and it's like i mean everything including the art whatever thought process the artist it's you know like the internal dialogue that we have while making work uh, any any and all thought the artist had while making the work like that all of that is and and you know like it's kind of cool how, how far it can be extrapolated in that sense it's like all right so you have the artist and basically anything and everything the artist is thinking of while they're trying to make the work and all of their circumstances that surround the artist mm -hmm. during the making of the work meaning i don't know you can choose or no you can't choose because it's like everything basically maybe that's happening in the world simultaneously and it's like you know you could argue that for sure mm -hmm. um and so like the resulting piece of work is like a solid piece of evidence or a solid a solidification of all of that mm -hmm. put together and it's kind of like it's kind of uh it's kind of makes each object of art really big in a way like yeah. that that's pretty cool it's it's a continuous dialogue you know and you know maybe we don't think we have lineage a thousand years ago like you know we're painting we're painting because of them still you know oh absolutely the name of or for the sake of them or something of that nature i don't know oh yeah absolutely it's like i mean you know the the term of like our ancestors is taken back to the first i mean it could it could be like the first it could be like homo sapiens it could be homo sapiens sapiens but mm -hmm. really it's uh way farther back than that and that is really cool in my opinion uh well i think uh, obviously if you you brought it up obviously you think something of the sort as well and that's really cool okay um All right, then. All right, okay, so then what is beauty? I think in, for me, and I'm sure many people that have been on this podcast have said that it's, it's not, maybe it's not universal. I feel like I'm coming at this from like a, Western vernacular of like, what is beauty? I mean, even my ideas of the sensations of space are all deeply rooted in, in Western philosophy. So I guess for me, what beauty is, is sort of like, it is a resting place. Resting place? Yeah, I think okay. it, it is. It, and then going back to that idea of sort of like silence and, and contemplation, I feel that beauty 
sort of allows me to confront, dare I say, kind of the sublime, um, sort of the, uh, again, like that, that infinity, that continuous sense of self, um, and what is sort of beyond the self. Um, and being confronted with that is, is you know, deeply kind of beautiful. Um, I also think that there are layers to beauty that it, yeah, first and foremost is probably aesthetic, you know, and it can be argued, is that innate or is beauty learned? I think that it is like actually deeply ingrained in us because I read a study somewhere, it was a long time ago, but they said like babies understand attractiveness but maybe what they really meant to say was beauty because like you know like some of your friends will be like that baby never smiles at me in a restaurant why is that <laughs> i don't want to say well i've read this article that means that like if the baby doesn't find you particularly attractive in any way they're kind of off put by you nobody taught that baby what is beautiful so like that leads to so many other questions is it symmetry is it the fact that you sort of have a beautiful soul um, that they're seeing? Is, are you smiling? Are you wearing bright colors? You know, what what is it? Are you kind of uncanny? You know, does the baby have a sensation for that? I, I don't I don't know, but I think what it shows us is that it is is deeply human to find like aesthetics beautiful. And then I think the other layer of beauty is sort of like an experience, um, sort of like it uh, becomes sort for me like the experience of maybe something structured in a really fascinating way, or there's sort of a like a logic to it, like a rationale. I, I do find like rational things to be oddly beautiful, mm. just as much as something that is like falling from the sky and completely illogical but um yeah the, the structure math or the geometry of a thing to me is like very kind of actively beautiful mm -hmm. and that that gives me a sense of then pleasure right experience and pleasure and then like that activation of kind of emotion whether that be sentimentality or anything else, but I think, yeah, there's aesthetics and then there is pleasure. Because, I mean, as an art maker, I go into the studio, I'm not telling myself I'm gonna make something beautiful. Mm. What I think keeps me coming back to making art is that I do find kind of a natural beauty in continuing to learn something, right? So like, that's the logical part of me that says, I, I deeply crave nourishment in the sense of learning and exploration. And then that creates sort of this pleasure moment as you're making something, you know? Um, and then the, the results of the beauty, I guess could be argued maybe what keeps you in it. Which sounds really- It's what keeps you in it? Yeah, it gives you validation, right? When you make something beautiful, like that baby will smile at your lovely face. It, you know, a viewer comes over and says, I really like that work. Mm -hmm. And I think without beauty, they kind of have a hard time understanding, especially the abstract concepts that we're presenting to the world now. Um, so so yeah, maybe beauty, beauty sadly gives me a little validation at the end of the day, but I think all of those other things that lead to the finished product are deeply as the maker. Um, and that, you know, that's, I guess that could be for any art, but mm -hmm. it's just specifically visual art, you know, much easier for people to like, be able to speak on behalf of like beauty and music, right? Yeah. Just something, again, that's innate. You don't tell somebody what sounds beautiful. They just feel the beauty in mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. And it harkens back to something. 
you know, just as I like, I deal with the idea of memory, like my memories will always be more beautiful than the reality of the situation. Why I think all of our memories are like that, or they would not be something that we look back on with such fondness, mm -hmm. right? We create more beauty inside of our recollections than what is what we walk in every day. So that must mean that we need it on some very instinctual level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, the subject has definitely been mentioned uh, in previous episodes about, well, at least in the case of art, which is arguably a carrier of beauty, you know, depending on the work, um, or can be a carrier of the beauty, depe of, of beauty depending, but um, that both art and beauty are effectively necessary for our survival. Um, and and um, I think case in point of that is the fact that we have been making our ancestors, effectively, we have been making different types of art, or just art in general, since the beginning, like since we had to be hiding from thunderstorms or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that for sure speaks to the importance of having it in our lives in some capacity. Whether you're the person making it or you're the person looking at it, we need its company. Yeah. And um, even even if it, because like, uh, again, and um, may, hopefully I don't, I mean, <laughs> it's just, I, I feel like I've said, I've said it several times now in different episodes, but it's like, even if the purpose of both, you know, art and beauty, it isn't as obvious as like, this is for writing, that's the purpose. Even mm -hmm. if the purpose of them is not that obvious, it doesn't mean that it's, that it, that they don't have a purpose, you know, because uh, for sure, I mean, we're hard pressed to even find a definition for both, you know, it's like, and, and it's like, you know, I'm not trying necessarily to find like a dictionary definition for either one of, of uh, like, you know, t a couple of phrases mm -hmm. to explain what they are, what, uh, you know, art and beauty are, but um, um, like, especially in the case of beauty, because I think beauty is, um, I mean, it's like by default, uh, uh, an, an abstract concept. And I, and I agree with you in that it has as different aspects to it one of them being what something looks like, like the appearance of something will, you know, that is what attracts you to the object or the person or a landscape or, I mean, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's also the, the sensations and the feelings that observing an object or remembering, you know, like the memory, the, what you were talking about, the, the kind of feeling that it elicit, those things elicit uh, yeah. in the person who is observing the object or remembering whatever it is, uh, for sure. Yeah. Um, that is also an aspect of beauty that has, you know, nothing to do with seeing something necessarily. Oh, yeah. Or having a, the object, a solid object in front of you, you know? In that way about language, too. Like, I think, in my printmaking, I use language, and in recent, you know, years I've been using language in some of my drawings, but kind of like this, I don't know, like if you were to name an object without seeing it, you know, like if I say the word tree, you're not mm. thinking ugly, you're thinking mm. beautiful. Yeah. If, if you had the choice between one or the other word. So I think that's also a really interesting distinction too, is that like we have our pictorial language, we have linguistics, and yet we do have a presiding definition for what is beautiful in either, you know, category, if, if you were to say. So it's like trying to figure out like what might be like a word that is ugly. Um, and I'm trying to think like, what would my students say? Because they always come up with something very clever, but maybe something that is like instinctively harmful, like fire. Fire is ugly. You know, there's a meaning behind that just as like the image of fire might have the same indexical value to it, so to speak. So, mm -hmm. um, and I do think that when we're speaking about any sort of language, I think when it comes to beauty, it's always like what is sort of surrounding it. So like the only way you're gonna know if something is beautiful is if by default you are confronted with, you know, like the harshness of a storm, the harshness of uh, 
reality or certain circumstance, right? It's by that contrast or by that tension of something that is less pleasant that we have the ability or desire to seek something more beautiful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. To seek, to find it solace, I think. Because um, it is, I think it is a comforting thing to have the beauty. It's something that we can, yeah, relate to. Would you mind going a little bit more into what you were just saying about the contrast of I'm not because I'm not sure if, if I understood what you're saying because so because yeah. uh, okay so you were talking about the thunderstorm and it's it can be intimidating and scary but but it's yeah. well doesn't so after a storm passes and let's say the sun comes back out and beautiful shadows and and you know prisms or there's a rainbow the right smell. the smell after the storm so yeah so by contrast you can say to yourself that is beautiful because mm. you saw what just occurred right think of think of doris salcedo a lot in my work um she's a colombian installation artist so cultural i don't even want to say it's sentimental but it's very prolific and i can't think of any other word but to call the work beautiful but it rooted in like extreme circumstance meaning that she was dealing or speaking on behalf of the violence that's happening in colombia how do you make something beautiful when you speak of violence it's only in knowing the violence that you can then enter a space with something beautiful and say you have transformed this you know all these horrible acts into a singular object that I can reflect upon with beauty and silence and all of these other layered things that I think she touches upon. So I think she's a great example to me of like that tension between just something harsh and sharp and then also like soft and beautiful. Mm -hmm. And it keeps you in that room looking at the objects that she makes. Like, yeah, you, you can speak of, of violence but it, there's there's not a line or a thread of poetry that connects us to our humanity and sort of the full extension of our experiences in this world thunderstorms and rainbows like you know then we we're a little bit lost you know yeah okay yeah i can i can see what you're saying um who who else could because there's a spanish artist I mean, I, I want to say Goya, but I mean, wasn't there a guy who painted like a uh, Spanish war, some people getting like uh, uh, executed with a shotgun? I mean, there's paintings of this type of stuff from the past. I don't, I mean, I, I think it was Goya or Velasquez, one of the two. Mm -hmm. uh, and they painting. Oh, and you know what? Yeah, you know who cool. else? Uh, a fellow draftsman, uh, Kath Kollwitz, also. Oh, sure. And printmaker, yeah. I think, also. And she effectively, she was able to take these uh i mean like uh similarly to what you're saying i mean i don't know if that artist was there when those things happened but uh what she's representing but uh kath Kollwitz saw with her very own eyes like all of these people just uh i, I I'm, I'm not even sure I, I don't remember what war it was but uh it's just, you know there's the one about the i mean it doesn't even have to be sp specifically a war no. and it doesn't have to be uh, because I'm thinking specifically about the mother that is holding her dead child. Oh, Kath Kollwitz? Kath, Kath Kollwitz, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, like, I don't have to have a child to know right. that that is, you know, her conveying this message, you know, because... Uh, um, the, the, she's holding the kid with, like, despair. Yeah. Uh, hopelessness so um, it's just you know um, I just I don't need to have experienced that or have a child or uh, have seen it or anything to just be moved by it you know hey, exactly. yeah, um, okay. yeah so yeah I see what yeah I mean it's I think that's a, a you know the idea of having the contrast that contrast I mean similarly you know similar because that's something that I like when 
um, you know, when I'm making work myself, it's like that very contrast of marks, like you were saying just now about the charcoal, the, the deep black charcoal versus the white paper. It's like that contrast is um, is attractive, mm -hmm. and it calls it calls the attention. And and it's like so when you make when when uh, you know when looking at a drawing, it's like the relationship between all of the variety of marks. It's like so like the contrast between them. I feel like it speaks kind of like it makes me think of uh, this th this very contrast in the relationship between beauty and ugly that you're talking about or just no, I mean ugly is an oversimplification I mean just horrible yeah. shit yeah 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 I mean we had I think like then we just desire something more out of that right and I think that's where art comes in or music or dance it's it's a a moment of pause that you can sort of ingest something that is unlike a world that surrounds you or you know seemingly like it close enough that like you're able to have a moment with it um and sort of celebrate that kind of sense of beauty or calm that comes with that whatever the image may be mm. uncanny i don't know like the uncanny can be deeply beautiful oh for sure you know it's curious it goes back to like the mind you know, I don't think like you have to be a, an intellect to like see beauty, right? So. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, that was awesome and intense. <laughs> uh, I think this is a good place to start cutting it off to end this episode. Okay. So, uh, Jess, please tell our viewers and listeners what you're up to lately, uh, where your work can be found. Do you have any upcoming, uh, any anything in particular you want to talk cool. about? Yeah, so I mean, I'm always teaching. I'll be teaching at the academy of your perspective, spatial concepts. I do printing workshops uh, outside of the Lower East Side, Manny Cantor Art School. Uh, and then I believe I'm going to be trying to shoot for maybe a two person show sometime this summer uh -huh. in Brooklyn. I forget the name of the space, but you know, check out my Instagram at the studio. Um, I'm sure there's something else, but I really cannot remember. Yeah, I mean, my studio is sort of always open, and Bushwick Open Studios will probably be in the fall, so I will obviously be showing my work there as well. So lovely. Okay, I want to encourage you to post more on Instagram <laughs> I know. about your about your projects and just whatever it is that uh, you're working on. The mystery. I like I like the veil of, of mystery. What? <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's mysterious, you know, that I post almost nothing. <laughs> well, no, it's just that, like, for example, the, uh, all right, just, I was just looking at this. The last post that you have is after the open studios. <laughs> Indeed it is, of last year. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, all right, so it happened already. I can't go anymore. <laughs> all right. But I mean, that's what I'm saying. That it's like you you try try to post it before too. <laughs> so no, I, I, I know to when to go. Best. You're very good about it. I'm, <laughs> it's a New Year's resolution from five years ago. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I I mean, I'm not. It's just you know, it's actually for me, it's been like the opposite a little bit recently. I'm just like rebelling against posting. I've been I haven't posted in like weeks or something, because you know, there's like this whole other thing that probably doesn't pertain to the podcast uh, just like this whole relationship that we have with social media and what a just how absurd it fucking is yeah. um but anyway so maybe we should just talk about that another time and not and not yes. um uh, bring that part two huh part two technology versus beauty part two yeah and we could and we could talk about in that case digital art because uh you know you you touched upon it there for a bit yeah sure uh, and yeah, no doubt it in the, the Instagram especially influences the work people make because like sometimes I feel like people will straight up just make a square painting just because the, you know, that's what it looks like in, uh, that's what you scroll by on Instagram. Right. It's like, and when you take a picture, you can only uh, fit the square in there, you know, like this kind there's of stuff. There's a brilliance to that because if anybody goes on my Instagram, they'll see some pictures dropped in weird ways, my friend. Yeah, yeah, it's like, yeah. We, and I mean, I'm not, I'm not necessarily complaining about that aspect because I mean, the square is great, of course. It's a lovely geometrical figure, uh, form. And very difficult to um, create a composition inside. It's much more difficult than a rectangular format. So, uh -huh. yeah, I don't know if you've tried it, but 
square on all equal sides, that geometry can be whew, very um, humbling. <laughs> yes, indeed. All right. Well, yeah. So, okay. I like this idea about a part two and I, I, I might take you up on it actually. And I think I, uh, I, I'm into the progressing into those, those subjects. Okay. All right. So then, well, Jess, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you very much for your time, your words and your thoughts. Thank you everyone for joining us. Feel free to let Jess and I know what you think of this conversation in the comments section. Also, I invite you to subscribe to my audiovisual channel because more of these conversations are coming. I also invite you to like this video and share it with any and all pertinent individuals. If you want to support Jess, myself, this podcast, or all three, the links will be in the video description below. So see you next time. Thank you everyone for your time. Bye. Bye. Thank you.